What's happened represents a, a repudiation, in a sense, at least in a temporary sense, of not only the policies of Senator McCarthy and McGovern, but those of set forth by Senator Edward Kennedy in his speech, those carried to the people for years by Senator Robert Kennedy and all the progressive and people of the Democratic Party who wanted to change this course. That was former speechwriter to Presidents Kennedy and Johnson, Dick Goodwin, expressing his displeasure with the Democratic Party's nomination of Hubert Humphrey at the 1968 National Convention in Chicago. And joining us now is Pulitzer Prize winning author and presidential historian and wife of the late Dick Goodwin, Doris Kearns Goodwin. She's back today for the final day of her Morning Joe residency to discuss <laughs> her new book, An Unfinished Love Story, A Personal History of the 1960s. And as you can see, deeply personal to Doris. Deeply personal. And Doris, I want to rewind about seven years from when that interview was taken in 1968 and talk about uh, how, how Dick uh, saw JFK up close and saw how much, how open-minded he was to viewpoints not his own. You know, what was so interesting to me was really we had a front row seat when we went through these boxes to watching JFK grow as a candidate and as a leader. And I think one of the moments that I loved watching with Dick and thinking about from the boxes was that when he arrived at the University of Michigan in October of 1960, he was simply going there to sleep and he was gonna have a whistle stop tour the next day and instead, 10,000 kids were waiting for him. And he figured, uh-oh, I better say something to them. So he gave a three-minute speech. That's all it was, you know, just saying, how many of you might be willing to go to Ghana? How many of you might be willing to go to other developing countries to help people abroad? And a college should mean something more than simply an economic advantage. It should mean finding a sense of purpose. The kids were so inspired by those three minutes. He said it was the longest short speech. And then he finally said, I'm just going to bed. And they all clapped. Um, they, they themselves got a pledge together for a thousand kids to be willing to give up two years or three years of their life in public service abroad. And that was the birth of the Peace Corps. So that's one of those moments that really was just fun to see that it was the inspiration that was provided and the kids themselves did the job. And then I guess the yeah. other moment that I loved was at the inauguration, Dick is at the parade. Everybody's at that parade freezing because it's so cold and, and Kennedy wouldn't wear a coat so nobody else could wear a coat. And afterwards, Dick went in to inspect his digs in the West Wing. And who was in there doing the same thing but John Kennedy? And John Kennedy said to him, did you see the Coast Guard contingent? And Dick could not remember one contingent from the other. And he said, there wasn't a black face among them, John Kennedy said. We have to do something about it. Dick was so excited. It was his first real job in the White House. He didn't even know where the Coast Guard was. It turns out it was in the Treasury. He called them up and started a process by which the first black um, person became a cadet in the Coast Guard, and then a series of other symbolic acts were making, taken in the various parts of the, of the federal government. Wow. And I was able to interview the widow of that a wonderful man named Merle Smith, who's now, his picture is now at the museum in, in, in Washington. So it, it's a great right. fun story. Wow. Well, and, and, and also talk about uh, his growth in office in good times, but especially in bad after the Bay of Pigs. Uh, a disaster uh, in every way, and everybody's pointing fingers at each other. We've seen many presidents uh, try to find somebody to throw under the bus, to blame, uh, not JFK. And you're so right, Joe. I mean, that week after the Bay of Pigs fiasco was one of the hardest weeks. Dick said he walked around the White House looking at JFK and he could see the pain on his face. Jackie later said that he came into the mansion and simply put his head in his hands and wept. And that was not something that she had seen very often at all. But then what happened is there was a breakfast meeting to prepare him for the first press conference that he would do after the Bay of Pigs. And everybody was saying, oh, make it the state, make it the generals, you know, call the CIA responsible. And he said, no, I am the responsible officer. I am taking this responsibility myself. And then he made that famous statement, you know, success has a thousand fathers, defeat is an orphan. And then extraordinarily, his public opinion polls went up. It went up to 83 percent because he had taken responsibility and acknowledged errors. But most importantly, he learned what was wrong with his decision making structure and he changed it to bring in Bobby Kennedy to make sure he didn't rely on experts as he had before and that made it possible mm. for the Cuban Missile Crisis to be handled so much better than the Bay of Pigs which was a much more important crisis.
Dick, how, uh, Dick. Dick, oh my God. <laughs> Mike and, Mike's known Dick and me for a long time. So how did Dick <laughs> manage to crack the relationship between Sorensen and JFK and establish a relationship of his own with the president? Yeah, it wasn't easy because, I mean, Sorensen was the speechwriter and had been with John Kennedy for such a long period of time, and they had a, a really deep friendship. And Sorensen mentored Dick at the start. Dick learned from him how to do a Kennedy speech. And then it just happened that I think what really happened is one of the days they asked Dick to do a speech on Latin America because Sorensen was doing a more important speech on something else. And he wrote not only a speech, but he came up with a whole concept of the Alliance for Progress, which was a billion-dollar program to give money to Latin American countries if they would have land redistribution and social reform, which meant those dictators would be losing some of their power down there, a very hard thing to do. And Jack Kennedy really loved the idea that he had had ideas on policy, not just simply on writing. And they went to Latin America three times together, and he became his man. He couldn't do it today. The bureaucracy is such. He didn't know any Spanish. He'd never been to a Latin American country. He spoke Berlitz. Neither did JFK. And the funny thing, when he was writing the speech for him, he put in a few Spanish words for him because he said they'll like it. JFK said, do I really have to say them? He practiced them, and he practiced them, and he never quite got them right. <laughs> So, Doris, uh, you know, so many Democrats look back so fondly at the Kennedy administration, Camelot, and the, 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 the sort of glamour of it. Um, but talk to us a little bit about some of the, the way that the president works and the, that White House worked that would be applicable today. What lessons could a president today or a, a future president learn from how uh, the JFK and his team made their decisions and led the country in an inspiring fashion? Yeah, I think one of the things that JFK did well, and, and so did FDR, was to reach down below the people who were the cabinet officers to like the desk officers, because he always knew that sometimes the people on top were concerned about their own departments rather than what was good for the country as a whole. And he needed to find the bright young people at different levels. he just call them up all of a sudden or have them come over. And FDR did the same thing, and I think that's one of the things they did. But most importantly, somehow... Kennedy inspired a sense, and I realized this, I, I was always the LBJ girl, always arguing with Dick that LBJ was the one who got everything done and Kennedy didn't do as much as him, and he was always arguing Kennedy was the one. But I came to see that what inspiration meant was that he made that team feel they wanted to come in there early in the morning, they wanted to stay after midnight. There was a real camaraderie, I think, within that White House. And the White House is a house. And it becomes that. It was, that was a certain moment when Dick went too far with meeting with Che Guevara and had to be banished to the State Department. And he felt that he had been banished from a place that was a, a, a real home where he could see people, mm. they'd eat in the mess together. And there was a camaraderie of that team. Of course, there were divisions between it. Of course, there were arguments between them. They, but they felt... They were, they were young. I think that's what made a difference, too. I mean, they're 28, they're 30, they're 32. They're, he's only 42. And they felt a sense yeah. of that there was an excitement in the country. There was an air that they were creating that people wanted to be in public service. John Kennedy talked about politics as an honorable vocation. And there were a lot of people who wanted to go into public life. And that's what we need right now in this country, is that sense that politics can be at its best something extraordinary. We have a feeling of a broken political system right now. We could use a little bit of that magic. Yes, we could. The new book, An Unfinished Love Story, A Personal History of the 1960s, is on sale now. Doris Kearns Goodwin, thank you so much, and congratulations on this book. It's, it's amazing. amazing. Wow. Oh, so thank exciting. you so much. Take care, guys. All right. Thank you. Hey, everyone. MSNBC has a new and improved app. You'll get real-time alerts and analysis, live blogs, in-depth essays, video highlights, and the best 2024 election coverage. Download the new MSNBC app. Here's how to do it. You tap on the App Store on your phone. You hit search on the bottom right corner. You type in MSNBC. You click on the MSNBC app. You click on get or the cloud icon and enjoy it.